Uh, I'll start at. I, uh, we start on time, I think. Okay, okay. So. Okay. Yeah, you can stop sharing and uh, other speakers can try their screen sharing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, are there any other speakers in this session? Jacob, can you hear me? I think you are the... I, I just uh, managed to get my sound working. So yes, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I see. Uh, even, I think you are the presenter of one paper. Yes, I'm here. Can you try to share your screen to see if it works or not? Okay, I'll have to try. Cool, it works. Okay. Great. I'll just test mine too, if it's okay. Sure. Yep, that looks right. Great, it works well.
doing his medicine. Is the is the presenter of the third paper already in this session? The paper a CMS network based on recursive autoencoder for effective clone detection. Is any also in this paper appear in this session? No. Okay, so the volunteer, can you try to play the video of that one? You can try to see if it works or not. Yeah, can you play a bit to try this song? I think it's not this one. It should be the third paper. Uh, CMS network based on recursive autoencoder for effective clone detection. Yeah. I, I think you mute yourself. I mean, you are muting yourself in the Zoom. Can you unmute yourself? There is no sound. I mean, the Zoom, I think the player works, but uh, your Zoom, you are muting yourself in the Zoom. You, you cannot hear the sound. There is no sound. <clears throat> yeah, come here. How? 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 Uh, I think this is the third one. You can try it later. Uh, maybe the presenter will come out uh, at that time. So you can try it and I think we can start uh, this session. <clears throat> okay, so thanks all uh, for coming to this AppSec session. So uh, so it's really a pity that we cannot see each other physically in Singapore. Actually, I really miss Singapore. I got my PRD from there and uh, 
but due to COVID-19, unfortunately, we, can meet there. we cannot meet there. So we have to put everything online. Um, so, but still, uh, we can still share the paper and share our ideas uh, in this session. So there are totally four papers in this session and uh, we have enough time for the present presentation of uh, the, each work. So I think uh, we give, we allocate 15 minutes for the presentation of one paper and five minutes for Q&A session. So first, uh, I hope that you can all mute yourself uh, during the presentation. And uh, you can, if you have any questions, you can ask in the chat channel, or uh, because we don't have so many participants in this session, I guess uh, in the Q&A session, you can ask uh, by the voice directly. So yeah, so that is uh, some very basic rules about uh, this session. So I think now everything is fine and uh, let's start the first one. Uh, the, the first paper will be a benchmark study of the contemporary toxicity detector on soft engineering interaction. So welcome to the first speaker. Okay, let's share my screen. Cool. Uh, let's share the screen. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Uh, Go good morning, everyone. I am Joy Sharkar from Owen State University, U USA. Today, I am going to present our research work, which is titled "A Benchmark Study of Contemporary Toxicity Detectors on Software Engineering Interactions." So, what is toxicity? According to the Zixo AI team, a text can be marked as toxic if it contains offensive name, insults, personal attacks, flirtations, sexual reference, cursing, or profane words. So here are two examples of toxic words, uh, toxic sentences. Uh, it contains the curse words or profane words. You can see it here. Now, uh, the recent studies found that the software engineers sometimes frustrated for having toxic contents in their interactions. Sometimes for that reason, they may leave the project or it takes longer time than usual uh, in their project for using the toxic uh, interactions. There are different existing tools for detecting toxicity in general domain, Perspective API is one of the state of art tools, which is developed by Google uh, conversational AI team. And this API uh, is trained with a large scale uh, data set. And to improve the toxicity detectors in general domain, Kaggle started a competition from 2018, which is called Toxic Comment Classification Challenge. Now the question is why do we need the toxic comment detection in software engineering domain? According to our prior study, NLP uh, domain need to be uh, trained and tested with the domain specific data. So for that reason, Ramon and his colleagues uh, developed a tool which is called CMU Studio tool in 2020 uh, for detecting toxicity in software engineering domain. Actually, they combined the perspective API with Stanford politeness detector for uh, building their tool, but they evaluated their tool only with 654 text in software engineering domain. For that reason, their uh, performance of their tool and their reliability of their tool are questionable. So our study objective was to empirically evaluate the Strudel tool as well as four other state of art general purpose toxicity detectors on a large scale software engineering data set. But there are several challenges in building the software engineering toxicity data set. First of all, the toxic comments in the software engineering communication is rare. For that reason, the data set uh, can be unbalanced and there is no 
uh, set of rules for labeling the data set in software engineering domain as toxic or not. Moreover, software engineers uh, have some specific jargons or, or they sometimes use some technical words that can, uh, that can have uh, like misclassification. So to overcome these issues, we have developed our research method like this. Firstly, we have selected our data set. Then we empirically built a rubric for software, uh, engineer, uh, software engineering communication to label the data as toxic or not. Then we have done our manual labeling on our large scale data set. We have selected five tools for evaluating their performance. Finally, we empirically evaluate the performance of the toxicity detector tools in our software engineering data set and which can uh, help for further research. We have selected two open source uh, data set uh, for uh, building the toxicity data set in software engineering domain. These are code review and guitar messages. So guitar is a platform when the software developers are uh, interacting with each other and it is integrated with Git. We have selected uh, three uh, open source projects in code review. One is Android, second one is Chromium OS and the third one is LibreOffice. And we have mined all the data using Gerrit Miner. Now, the, the, we faced a problem to handle with the unbalanced data set. Uh, you can see that th there are the total number of messages in our data, but to develop a balanced data set, we did a opportunistic selection by leveraging the Perspective API. We have used Perspective API for this selection because Perspective API is a state of art tool for detecting toxicity in general domain. And here are the number of selected toxic tests, which are like 1% of the whole number of messages. So for that reason, to build our data set, we have selected all the toxic tests and we have selected around the same number of non-toxic tests to balance our data set. Then uh, we gave focus on developing the rubrics. Uh, our initial rubric was based on the guidelines published by the conversational AI team. Then two of our authors uh, independently evaluated thousands of texts in software engineering uh, communication and they uh, set uh, rules for uh, labeling the data set. And finally, a discussion session was held to unify the set of rules for labeling. So two of our authors then independently labeled uh, the data set based on our established rubric. And we have found that their agreements is uh, more than 90% for code review and guitar messages. And we have also calculated the Kappa score, which is uh, substantial for uh, code review and uh, guitar messages and the uh, conflicts are resolved after the mutual discussions. So if you are interested to know more about our rubric, you can see our paper. So this is our final data set overview. We also randomly selected 3000 text from Jigsaw sample data set, which is from the Kaggle, uh, because we need to uh, compare uh, this non software engineering data set with our software engineering data set. So our final uh, data set is like this. We selected 3000 text, which was already labeled by the Jigsaw team and uh, the, the code review and guitar Ethereum uh, from the software engineering data set, which are labeled by two of our TIA authors. Then we have selected five tools for evaluating our uh, data set. First of all, we have selected the Perspective API. As I mentioned before, that Perspective API is a state of art tool for detecting toxicity in general domain. Then we selected Strudel tool because it, was, it is the first tool for detecting toxicity in software engineering domain. The last three tools, the Deep Pyramid Convolutional Neural Network and BART with Fast AI and Hate Speech Detector, those are selected because uh, 
these tools are published as a paper in a conference and, or journal and their code is publicly available. Now, our research question one is how do contemporary toxicity detectors perform on a software engineering data set? So we can see the results here for Zixor data set, all tool performed well and DPCNN got the best performance according to F-score and accuracy because Zixor is from like general domain data and in Gitar, it, the performance degrades than the Zixor because Gitar are the chat messages for software engineers. Here they use like technical and non-technical terms, but in code review, most of the tools perform very low because here the data is mainly from the technical terms and the in code review comments that consist uh, most of the software engineering terms. So our finding one is that uh, all of our five tools have significant performance degradation on software engineering data set, but they have moderate agreement for chat messages. Now our research question two is, what are the categories of software engineering text that contemporary toxicity detectors are more likely to misclassify? There are uh, some texts which are toxic under general context here, but in software engineering domain, like if you see this example here, the word kill means the stop the process. So all of our tools predicted is as toxic, but it's labeled as non-toxic in software engineering domain. So uh, here are our finding is that most of our tools are more likely to fail on words that have different meaning in software engineering context. Our last research question, research question three is, does retaining on a software engineering data set improve the performances on contemporary toxicity detectors? And we have retrained two models, DPCNN and BFS for our software engineering data set, code review and guitar Ethereum. Uh, we retained th uh, two models because those are publicly available for retaining and we have done the tenfold cross validation. And we have found that for code review data set, DPCNN performs well, and for Guitar Ethereum data set, BFS performs well. But there is a lot of scope to improve the, this uh, result, uh, for, especially for uh, recall and F score. So yeah. our finding three is that uh, the, the, both tools have significant performance improvements uh, a large scale data set may further improve the result. So from this, this study, we have learned the following things. First of all, most of the existing toxicity detector tools are reliable in identifying the profanities, but uh, all the tools are not reliable in software engineering text. And Finally, we have found that retaining of two tools improve the performance. Then uh, we need the software engineering specific pre-processing to improve the performance of the tool. So we can think that we can exclude the software engineering specific words, but that can cause the false negatives. Like here is an example, like in this word, like die sometimes means uh, non-toxic in software engineering domain. If we remove the die from this, remove or exclude die from this text, then it will be non-toxic. But in that case, in this context, uh, this means uh, toxic. So we cannot remove this. And we need to identify the expressions with humility. Here is an example. Sometimes uh, here we have two sentences which are added with and, and sometimes I am dumb. Uh, it was told uh, by the reviewers, that means refers himself or herself. So we empirically found that uh, this is non-toxic, but if it is non-toxic for software engineering domain, because it's common, but uh, you, uh, if we say like uh, you are idiot, here this is a toxic word. So for that reason, we need to consider about the humiliation in our context. So uh, finally, we can summarize our work. Uh, first of all, uh, we have empirically developed a set of rules to label the software engineering data as toxic or not. Then we have labeled a large scale uh, data set for software engineering. And we have evaluated five tools 
and we have found that uh, those five state of art tools have uh, low performance in software engineering data set and they failed uh, in software specific words. But finally, we have found that retaining improved the performance of our tools. So uh, our study may help the, for the future direction to develop the toxicity detectors in software engineering communication and which is uh, very helpful for the software engineering community. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in our work, uh, our data set is publicly available on GitHub. Uh, you can look into this and Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Epsic. Okay, so thanks a lot, uh, JDEP, for the nice presentation. So, are there any questions from the audience for JDEP? Okay, so uh, I think I have some questions. So, first, you mentioned you collect the toxicity data from different uh, platforms like uh, Android, uh, Chronominum, and so on. So how is the performance of the model in different projects? Is there any difference? Uh, I actually uh, divided the data set in two categories. One is uh, uh, code review. So I put the, all the data of code review from Chromium and uh, Chromium, LibreOffice, and Android together. So yeah. I did not uh, evaluate with, uh, with uh, like differently. So I put the three projects of uh, code review in a file and the guitar Ethereum is in different file. Yeah, I know, I mean- uh, So I combined, is... yeah, yeah, I combined uh, the code review data set uh, in together. Yeah, I think it's a good, uh, it's great to see if there are any difference between the characteristic of uh, different projects. So maybe Android developers are more positive, while other developers in different community are more negative, something like that. Okay, uh, okay, I will try that. Yeah, Thank you for question. the question. Yeah. Um, the other question is that about the data collection. So I, I see that you collect the data first using the PPA, right? right? Uh, it's, it's for uh, uh, toxic, yeah, for like, uh, for balancing our data set. We have already collected our data and for balancing our data set, uh, I use the perspective API. Yeah, because, so uh, because yeah. the toxic comments are rare in software engineering communication. So for that reason, we need to mine the specific toxic words first. Then we also collected the nearly same amount of non-toxic comments. Okay. Um, uh, but when you are labeling the, the sentence with the toxicity uh, content, so are you using some are you totally manually checking it all based on the data set collected from the perspective API? So first, first we uh, developed a rubric, as I mentioned uh, you, that uh, how can we label the data as toxic or not in software engineering perspective. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we use the perspective API to uh, like to, predict the score of all of our data set, like uh, 100,000 of our text, perspective mm -hmm. API generate a, a score. Then the score which is greater than 0.5, that means perspective API generates the score from zero to one. So mm -hmm. the score, if the score is point, uh, more than 0.5, we thought that uh, according to perspective API, it's a toxic. Then we manually evaluated that uh, uh, comment that is it actually toxic in software engineering perspective or not? Yeah, then but, we label the data. But it may bring some, it may miss some sentences like uh, uh, the general PPA may not work in some specific cases, so they may classify it as non toxical. Actually, it may be toxical, but uh, if it, the PPA misses it, then the consecutive manual checking may also miss that. Is it, yeah, is uh, yeah, yeah, you, you were right. And for that reason, for balancing that, 
what we did, we uh, generated the score for all like uh, one more than 1,000, uh, uh, sorry, 100,000 of uh, comments. And so firstly, we took the, the score, which is more than 0.5. Then we took like 10% from score 0.1 to 0.2 and then 0.2, 0.1 to 0.3 and 0.3 to 0.3.9, we sampled the data like this. Makes sense, makes sense. Okay, thanks, that's all my questions. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, thanks JDF for the okay, presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, uh, you can stop sharing and uh, thank you. Thank move to the next one. So the next paper is the technical like of dependencies in major package many managers. So Jacob, can you please start your presentation? Great, thank you. Uh, yes, let's go with that one. Okay, you should be able to see that now, I think. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name's Jacob. Uh, I am from Massey University and I'm here to talk about technical lag in particular. So uh, let's go over what is technical lag first of all. Uh, so it's this idea that almost all code that we use relies on other third party code. And so we need to be able to depend on that code and make a connection between them. Uh, Dependencies are usually, uh, this, this third party code, these dependencies are usually organized as discrete versions based on a particular publication date. Uh, and if your project has a dependency to a version of, uh, of another project that's not the most recent, that's, uh, that's technical lag there. So we consider technical lag as a software quality metric uh, because, uh, um, Research has shown that uh, projects with technical lag are four times more likely to have security issues, that they're more likely to, um, to have brittle code. For example, you have a dependency which is out of date, you want to update it to a new dependency, but uh, in order to do that, you need to make several changes to your own project. Depending on how long you leave this, how many changes there are to do, you may or it may or may not be practical to actually update this dependency to get these additional features. Uh, and it's worth keeping in mind too that technical lag does get inherited. So if you have a dependency which itself has technical lag, then you inherit that technical lag as well and you inherit its security vulnerabilities. Okay, uh, we're focusing in the study on how much technical lag exists. Uh, so security and code quality neg negatively correlate with technical lag, but the problem is that it takes time and it adds risk to remove this technical lag from a, pro uh, from a uh, project. So uh, it's been found that almost a third of projects actually add backwards incompatibilities by surprise. So this adds to the amount of risk that we face when we update dependencies as developers. So uh, if technical lag is prevalent through the industry and in particular open source uh, here, then reducing the cost associated with updating dependencies and reducing the risk involved with um, updating dependencies is a really worthwhile endeavor. Okay, let's talk about some of the more specifics of what I'm, we're gonna look at. Uh, so in the study, we assume that versions uh, run under semantic versioning, which is an industry-led standard that um, identifies that updates of a project come in different types. Could be bug fixes, could be improvements, could even be API changes or backwards incompatibilities. So, uh, and if you look at a version number, you should be able to say, hey, that was, a, that was a bug fix. Therefore, it's really safe for me to update this and I shouldn't need to worry about any uh, incompatibilities here. So as an example, say I have uh, version 4.7.6. If I make a bug fix to my program, I would expect it to update to 4.7.7. If I made a new feature, I might update the minor version instead to 4.8.0. Or if I actually make a change to the API and make a break uh, and make an incompatibility with a previous version, then I'd update the major version to 5.0.0. Uh, 
median. Now, if we look at how lag is calculated, I'll just run through it as an example. I think that's easiest to comprehend this way. So uh, we'll call project A the project that I'm working on and project B another project which I'm gonna add a dependency to at some stage here. So project A at the start of January uh, doesn't have a dependency to project B. But then we come to an update in March and at that stage we say, hey, there's something in project B that I need. So I'm gonna create a dependency to project B at, at version 0.9.8. Now, there's no technical lag, it's the latest version that is possible. Skip ahead to May, we have updated our project, but we haven't updated the dependency. In this time, uh, project B has had an update, so we're no longer using the latest version of that project, so we have some technical lag here. Uh, we can characterize this in a couple of ways. So we can say, hey, we're actually a micro version behind what the latest version is, so we have one micro lag here, one micro version of lag. Or we could say, well, this version 0.9.9 has been out for a month. So we're actually a month out of date as far as the dependency goes. Uh, right, so that's May. We skip ahead through to June now. We've um, we've found, oh, there's a new version of uh, project B, so let's skip uh, the dependency through to 0.9.9. And in this way, we've gotten rid of technical lag at that point. Uh, we move through to August when we make another update. Now, in that time, depend, uh, Project B has also made an update, but we have noticed this and we've updated our dependency to match. So even though uh, there was a new update in that time, we have updated our dependency. There's no technical lag in August. Finally, we skip ahead through to December, and uh, there's been a lot of changes in Project B in this time, but we haven't actually made any changes to the dependency, so now we have technical lag in December. Uh, we have quite a bit. We have five versions of lag here, uh, but another way to look at it is say, okay, well, if we had have been okay to have the bug fixes, we're actually two micro versions behind. We could have had 0 0.1.0.1. 1.0.2. Or we could say, hey, we had a minor version that was available to us. We could have updated to that. So we have one minor version of lag. Or I could say, hey, there's a new major version. So we've actually got one major version of lag. Uh, it could be 2.0.0, could be 2.0.1. The point is we have one major uh, version of lag at this point here. Okay, so that's a general idea of how we calculate this. Uh, let's look at some of the other parts. Uh, we are looking at different package managers. And in the sense of the study, we're looking at them as dependency managers because they're the ones that are gonna go and collect the versions of the dependencies that we need. So we're gonna say, hey, package manager, hey, Maven, hey, NPM, get me this dependency and, you, and get it from this particular version or this range of versions. Uh, we use 14 of the package managers, but we decided not to use three of them because they are um, the entirely open range base. They don't specify which version you need to use. So there's not technical lag if you do that. Um, now, the important part about this is that each package manager decides their own dependency resolution strategy. And that varies from package manager to package manager. So we're, we're kind of, um, we're kind of comparing apples with apples, but we're kind of looking at a, a pink lady versus a royal gala sort of thing. They're all slightly different from each other. Um, so here, even though you might want a particular version, say there's a transitive dependency where it needs two, uh, one version of two different uh, versions, the package manager has to choose one of those. Or you might say, okay, here's a range of versions. We expect that the package manager will get the highest version number that it can, but there's nothing to say that it will. In fact, uh, NuGet is more likely to choose the lowest one as I, as I last read it to their policy to be. A right, uh, couple more things, uh, version declarations. 
when we talk, when I, we tell a package manager we need a declaration, we say, okay, uh, we could say, get me version 1.3.0. I know it works. Don't, don't give me anything else. That would be considered a fixed version declaration. We could also equally say, hey, we've, got, we've worked with version 1.3.2. That works with us. But if you find another version gets released, which has um, some bug fixes, i.e. a micro uh, update, uh, get that for us. Don't, no, no need for me to be involved. I trust that it's going to work. So package manager, you can just go collect the new version. Uh, we can do that with minor versions as well. So um, we really focus on semantic version and compliant ranges in this study because we get more information about what the developer intends. So are we happy with the risk of adding in bug fixes without testing them first? Are we happy with the risk of having a new feature added in? We don't really, if we look at a custom range, such as in the bottom of this table, we can't actually say what the developer intends with that. So it's a little bit less of an interest as far as, uh, as, far as um, the study goes. Okay, last of all, let's look at the data set. Uh, so we're using a data set called libraries.io. It's, um, it's pre-made. It's a really great open source data set that tracks uh, Th almost 3 million projects. And there's a lot of dependencies between projects in the, um, in the package, uh, in the data set, over 200 million. Uh, in terms of the study, we look at the pairs of projects. So if we have a project A and there's a project B that has a dependency, we look at the relationship between those. Even if A has 10 other dependencies, we look at them independently of each other as a pair. Okay, so uh, just to, to give you an idea of how many, how much data we're working with here, if you look on the fixed uh, column here, there's almost 400,000 pairs of projects in Maven that we've looked at. Or if you look at the flexible column in um, here, you'd see, okay, there's about seven and a half million pairs of NPM uh, project, uh, project pairs here that we're looking at. Okay, uh, looking at the results, uh, there is a reasonable amount of lag across open source projects is how I would, is how I would um, explain this. In particular, we looked at, depending on the version type, what happens to lag here? Uh, is technical lag more under certain cases than others? And we found, yes, absolutely. Uh, if you have a fixed declaration, then it's much more likely that your dependency is going to lag than say if you had a minor version range where the package manager is able to, to an extent, update the dependencies as they come in without any developer intervention. Um, so fixed dependencies, uh, more about half, about half of them will lag. Whereas with a minor dependency, depending on the package manager, that can be under 10% of them. Okay, uh, if we look at the types of lag that, uh, that are prevalent, uh, of the uh, uh, um, dependencies that lag, about two thirds of them uh, have major lag of some description. It's not particularly surprising in the sense that major lag we do expect that a major update needs some development uh, uh, input to bring it up to speed. So there's no more compatible, so there aren't compatibilities between them. But on the flip side, we actually have a third of dependencies which lag, uh, which have minor lag or micro lag. And that is quite interesting because if you think about SEMVA compliant ranges, uh, minor minor ranges, for example, a package manager could eliminate this sort of technical lag completely if you just went with, uh, with the minor version range rather than, uh, rather than a fixed version or a micro version range here. So about a third of those would be eliminated just by changing the version, um, the version type to a SEMVA compliant range. And then about 10% of the uh, of uh, um, dependencies have major lag plus another kind of lag. And that other kind of lag, the minor, the micro lag, would be eliminated even if they're in a previous um, 
major range there. Okay. Uh, just having a look at the quantity of lag involved. Now, in the, on the whole, there is some lag in a lot of cases, but there's not generally too much of it. So most of the time, there's not more than a couple of versions worth of lag if you look on the, if you look on the left hand graph. Uh, it's more likely that there's going to be micro lag. Uh, again, there are about two thirds of um, updates are micro updates. So it makes sense that, that there's a little bit more micro lag. But if you look at the right side, where we're talking about time amounts of lag, uh, micro lag, you'd Projects don't usually hang around with this micro lag very long. They're much more likely to have a uh, major lag, uh, say, therefore much longer. They're, they're likely to put off that update a little bit more. Okay. Uh, we looked at fixed declarations in particular a little bit more just to see, okay, well, when a developer has to manually do this, how much more are they going, how much do they have to do? Uh, usually it was about less than 10% of the time fixed declarations were being updated. And if you look at how much technical lag there is involved, that basically boils down to that a lot of fixed dependencies are really um, are out of date, but developers aren't actually um, updating them. So we've got, we've got a real disconnect here between what they could do and what they are doing with fixed dependencies. Okay, finally, last, um, last part here is that we looked at um, back downgrades. So when, uh, when technical lag is increased, when they go back a version, uh, it's really rare. Uh, in Maven, it was one in 300 times compared to about one in 12 times updating. Uh, and it's pretty much for expected reasons, we went and had a look at some of these examples. Most of them were moving from unstable to stable releases or there were compatibility issues. So in conclusion, um, uh, technical lag is pretty common across package managers. Uh, and if we use more semantic version declaration ranges, we would in fact uh, bring this down quite a lot here. Um, now, how do we reduce this? There's a few things that we can do, I think. Um, increasing the amount of semantic version compliant declarations, so minor ranges, would help us immensely with this. Uh, there's plugins for GitHub and other source control plugin tools that will, um, that will allow a pull request, it will raise a pull request, and that means that a developer can say, oh, there's a new pull request here for an update. I'll try it out. Okay, it works, I'll, I'll um, merge it in. And then there's a couple of other things as well, such as um, check API compatibility checkers, just things that can automate the process of checking for compatibility and reducing this risk here. Um, I know I'm probably a little over time, so thank you everyone for listening and I appreciate being here today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Jacob, for the nice presentation. So this is a very interesting work. So thanks a lot. Uh, so any questions from the audience for this work? Okay, so I have one question. So it's great to know uh, you, you got so many findings uh, according to this empirical study and uh, I can see that you collect quite a lot of data and you summarize several uh, res uh, observation results from different aspects. So I'm thinking, okay, so how can we use those fun findings? So what's the implication of these findings? I think it really comes down to the slide that we're looking at at the moment, um, encouraging the use of of uh, SEMVA compliant ranges across package managers is one really easy way to reduce the amount of technical lag that we have uh, floating around. Problem is, is that there's risk evolved with, um, with having these minor ranges and so bringing down the risk levels, i.e. these compatibility checkers, uh, etc. This is really where we need to be heading, I think, as, a, as an industry just to make sure that the onus is, uh, we have less, developers 
don't need to take such an active role in this process that there's a bit there's more automation as opposed to so much of it being manual as currently happens in a lot of cases yeah cool thanks yeah. Nice. Any other question from the audience? No, that's great. Okay, thanks a lot, Jacob. Right. For the Thank that's you very all. much. Yeah, okay, so let's move to the third one. Uh, the paper, Sierra, a CMS network based on recursive autoencoder for effective clone detection. So it's any speaker of this work? No? Okay, then the one here, can you play the video of this work? Hello, is is the one here in this session? Okay, then I think let's let's go to the fourth work first, and then we go back to the third one. So, uh, so for the fourth one, it's about uh, Docker file changes in practice a large scale empirical study of 4,110 projects on GitHub. So even, can you start to present? Thanks. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. I'm glad to have the opportunity to make this presentation. The title of my paper is Dogfire Changes in Practice, a large-scale empirical study of 4,110 projects on GitHub. I'm Yiwen Wu, a second-year master student from National University of Defense Technology. Docker is one of the most popular containerization tools in current DevOps practice. It enables the encapsulation of software packages into containers and can run on any system. The annual container adoption report found that 79% of companies chose Docker as their primary container technology. Since inception in 2013, Docker containers have gained 5 million users and have been downloaded 130 billion times. The contents of a Docker container are defined by declarations in the Docker file, which specifies the Docker commands and the order of their execution, following the notion of infrastructure as code. Thus, starting Docker file is very relevant to Docker-based software development. In Docker, in Docker, Docker file is a is a text document that contains all the commands a user could call on the command line to assemble an image. This makes Docker file play an important role in the Docker based software development process. Docker runs instructions in a Docker file, and all instructions must start with a base image. Other parts are then added on top of the base one. Docker has provided multiple types of instructions in the Docker file involving from, run, copy, add, env, cmd, expose, and so on. This table gives the, the description overview of several important instructions. To meet the requirements of go or goals of project development, for example, efficient containerization outcomes, bug fixing, or function enhancement, the content of Docker file may be revised at different stages by project maintainers. These changes to Docker file show how the project infrastructure has evolved over time, which may vary between projects. The figure presents an example of Dockerfire exchange. 
from version zero to version one, this Docker file has been added three new lines for installing the package node static. Delete one line for removing the deprecated instruction maintainer and modified one line for fixing the invalid port number 80,000. And the figure gives an overview of our study. More specifically, we attempt to answer three research questions in this paper. RQ1, how often do Docker files change and what is changed? RQ2, how do Docker files change together with other files? Other three, uh, what is the relationship between Docker file changes and the project outcomes? Uh, our data involves mining two types of sources. Docker file data, that is Docker file revisions uh, using the Docker data set proposed in MSR data showcase. Struct, uh, structured information on state and evolution of Docker files on GitHub. It provides researchers the possibility to explore the Docker container ecosystem on GitHub. It has more than uh, 100,000 unique Docker files from about 15,000 GitHub projects involving project metadata. Uh, Docker file revisions, rural violations, and so on. And the other one is the project data, that is number of stars, number of contributors, and so on, using the GitHub v3 API. And in this study, we collect the uh, Docker file changes data from 4,110 4, projects, including 26,512 Docker file revisions. This table gives the basic descriptive statistics of started projects. The goal of RQ1 is to provide an initial view about the Docker file changes. Specifically, we analyze the three sub research questions. We find that each Docker file in our dataset changes an average of 6.5 times after the initial commits. The left figure shows the comparison of Docker file revisions between different project attributes. We find that projects with large contribute team or more files tend to change Docker files slightly more often than other projects. The right figure depicts the number of total added, deleted, or modified lines of Docker file code per revision. The it seems that so you are in the same size for quite a long time. Are you are you are you going to the NASA size or is that yeah. I cannot see your size now. Can you share your screen? Can you see my slides now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. And, um, and the right figure depicts the number of total added and deleted or modified lines of Docker file code per revision. The magnitude of each Docker file change is typically small, mean lines of code and mean 4.8. And compared to regular source code, Docker file change fewer lines of code. And the table uh, specifies how many changes refer to the instructions of different change types. We find that wrong instructions are changed more frequently than other instructions. Therefore, de uh, developers should pay attention to design those new run instructions to avoid build problems such as build failure and long build latency. Researchers should further investigate 
whether there are some common change patterns in run executable commands and parameters. These patterns in turn can provide guidance on developers to help them better modify run instructions. And in RQ2, we've investigated the code evolution of Dockerfile and other files. Specifically, we designed the three questions. Dockerfiles are coupled tightly with other files. Those code change revisions account for more than 17% of all revisions. And each project has an average of 23.4% of files code changed with their Docker files, containing 9.9 .9 different files per, per revision. We also compared the difference of code change revisions rate between different project attributes as shown in the figure as shown in the figure. We find that in all groups except project age, large projects tend to have more code change revisions than small projects and their differences between different groups are all statistically significant. Therefore, how to organize a large team to maintain the Docker fire configuration reasonably and uh, efficiently requires more method guidance. The left table shows the 10 top 10 and more frequently code changed file types. JavaScript code file account for 23.84% of all code changed files followed by Go code files. We find that the code changed files may depend on the programming language. In particular, JavaScript and Go files are frequently code changed with Docker file. The right table gives the top 10 most frequently code changed files. We find that README is the most code changed file. Inscription and so on. How to locate the the code evolutionary code fragments requires further explanation. In RQ3, we seek to explore the relationship between Docker file changes and project outcomes, including project popularity, project success, and um, project productivity. We develop three mixed effects linear regression models with the same random effect term of the programming language. Layer project popularity model, project success model, and project productivity model. The dependent variables of the three models are um, number of project stars as a proxy for the project popularity, number of project votes as a proxy for the project success and the number of project commits as a proxy for the project productivity. Our independent variables are mainly based on prior studies and come from two convert areas, project level and Docker file level. For example, project age, team science, file scale, and, and the number of Docker file revisions for the detailed discussion of each variable, please check our paper. And in our model, we find that changing Docker file more often, having more code change revisions are associated with more project stars, more project folks, and higher productivity. However, more types of Docker file instructions being changed per revision bring negative effects. Developers need to avoid modifying too many types of instructions in a single change, which may have a bad in impact on project maintenance. The industry needs to develop more management analysis tools and uh, visualization tools that support the evolution of Docker Fire. In summary, in this paper, we empirically study phenomena related to Docker file changes in a set of 4,110 open source projects posted on GitHub. We first investigate how, how often the 
Java files change, how many lines of code and uh, which instructions are changed. Next, we investigate how Docker file code changed with other files. Finally, we investigate the relationship between Docker file changes and the project outcomes, that is, popularity, success, and productivity by using regression modeling. Our findings provide insights into the situation of the current practice of Docker file changes in the open source communi communities and um, motivates the need for collecting more empirical evidence. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your listening. Okay, thanks even for the nice talk. So that's great. So any questions for this talk? Okay, so I have one question. So I can see that you you did an empirical study, so mostly about the quantitative analysis. It means that uh, you get quite a lot of numbers and uh, correlation statistics, but uh, I don't see much uh, quantitative qualitative analysis. It means, uh, for yeah. example, you can, uh, as you mentioned in slides eight, there are many revision of uh, about the run file, so. Do you summarize any reasons why there are so many revisions to, to, to that run files? So is there any uh, qualitative analysis? Uh, thank you for your suggestion. A more quantitative study could help improve our discussion. It is right. Actually, we plan to conduct the qualitative analysis in our future work. For example, we are planning to investigate why developers frequently change some instructions and the impact of the changes. For example, incorrect version updates may induce the, the bugs. Yeah. Yeah. We will yeah. do the inclusion. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. That's great to include that in your future work. So any question from the audience to the presenter? No? Okay. Thanks a lot, Ivan, for the nice presentation. And uh, so for the last one, I think the third paper. So I'm not sure if the any author of the third paper are here. The paper CMS network based on recursive autoencoder for effective clone detection. Any others are here? No? Okay. Then the one here, can you please uh, play the video, the recording of that presentation? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I I don't hear any voice. I'm not sure. It, it, it's, it's I think you are using the uh, headphone. Are you using the headphone? Yeah. So can you play. I think the sound is too is too small. I think you need to uh, give a higher volume. I cannot hear very clearly.
Uh, I think you can stop it. I can play it from my side. Okay, sure, sure. Okay. Can you stop sharing? Okay, sorry everyone. Uh, I think uh, this is wrong. Uh, I can play that video from my side. Uh, let me check. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to, to, to report my research. I'm the author from, from the National University of Defense Technology. Today, I will introduce my research for four parts. The first part is introduction. Firstly, what is a code? To improve the efficiency of software development, developers are accustomed to using or modifying existing open source code to develop their own software products, which leads to numerous code clones phenomena. Several studies suggest that the large software systems consist of code. The survey shows that 20% to 50% code lines of the existing large-scale open source software projects are highly similar to each other. So the code clone detection is finding of similar code. Code clone is a double-edged sword for programming. On the one hand, the code clone saves the time cost of developers and improves the efficiency of software development. It helps improve the programming productivity. On the other hand, it costs a lot of negative results 
cocoon leads to software redundancy, which would increase the scale of software and puts tremendous pressure on system resources. Code code may spread potential bugs or errors to all positions that we use in this piece of code. Also, code code is not beneficial for the design of the software, particularly in code reconstruction. In addition, code code brings challenges into software maintenance. So, the design of the structure, usability, and hammer the improvement. Next, I introduce the definitions. The code cone, it means that there is the same or similar code pieces between two software systems or two code files in one project. The code fragment means it's a continuum area of code lines in specific source file. And code pair means a pair of code fragments that similar more than a certain threshold. The generally accepted classification of code clone is proposed by CK Roy, who classified the code clone into four types with the difference of code multiplication. In type 1, identical code fragments except for differences in white space, layout, and commas. In type 2 clone, identical code fragments except for differences in identifiers and literals, as well as the differences in type 1. In type 3, there are statements can be changed, added, or removed in addition to Variations are in identifiers, literals, types, layout, and commands. In type 4 clone, it means two or more code fragments that perform the same computation but implemented so different syntactic variants. And Svajlenko further improved the classification criteria of type 3 and type 4 with similarity and made a more detailed classification. There are very strong type 3 asyntactical similarity above 90% is defined as a very strong type 3. And the syntactical similarity between 70 and 90 is called a strong type 3. And the syntactical similarity between 5, <coughs> 50% and 70% is regarded as minus type 3 and a syntactic similarity between 0 and 50% is divided into weak type 3 or type 4. Code cone detection finds cones pairs that results from code P and paste. The early research on the code cone detection dates to the 1990s. Many scholars devoted themselves to the code clone detection and proposed a great number of techniques and tools. Up to now, the state of the art tools performs very well in some scenarios that with high code similarity. For example, type 1, type 2, and very strong type 3 code clone. However, programmers often need to edit the clone code to fit their scenarios. Such operation leads to low similarity between code, the code snaps and make them extremely hard to detect. Most of the code code detectors reported in the literature fail to detect the low similarity codes, such as the MT3 and WT3 code types. Next, I will introduce the, our approach. The prior studies show that it is very difficult to detect low similarity code clones, especially for MT3 and WT3. The framework of our approach is shown in three stages. In the data preprocessing stage, we use an NTR4 to extract source code files to drive abstracted semantic trees in terms of functional granularity at first. Then we will use AST to gain to transform AST 
into a full binary tree. And we train the world to web to make a, a representation of words and the code rep representing, representing stage or STs were input into the trend RAE. After processing, each high dimensional vector represents an NST or one function and the similarity measurements design a comparable network with one classification unit for similarity evaluation. A RAE consists of autoencoders. Each unit of the RAE is an autoencoder encoding, encoding and decoding phases. Uh, autoencoder is one type of the technique for the reduction of data dimensions. You can extract the most expressive factors for high dimensional data. A typical automatic encoder shown in the picture is has a decoder layer, hidden layer, and a decoder layer. It's trained in unsupervised learning using gradient descent and back propagation algorithm to minimize reconstruction errors calculated by comparing inputs and outputs. We use RA for code feature generation. RA increasingly share with a full binary tree which is transformed from its abstract synaptic tree. It is continuous merged and reconstructs vectors of child nodes from the bottom to the top in the tree. RE starts at the leaves and ends at the root node. When training the RE, we minimize the reconstruction errors of the whole binary tree, including the root node and the no or non-terminal nodes. After that, we learn the vector representations and the root node of its AST. Assume we have a list of word vectors X1 to X4 as described in the picture. We have the form of branching triples of parents with trials. For example, the Y1 reads X1, X2. The child can be either input word vector or non-terminal node in the tree. In order to apply the same neural network to each pair of the child, the hidden representations Y, I have to the same dimensionality as X. So computing the similarity between code snaps, we embedded RE in a Siamese architecture to judge code pairs. An important feature of this structure is that it can handle the symmetry of the input vector. It means that showing a pair, function one and function two, to the model is the same as showing a pair, function two and function one. In this paper, the input to the model is a 300 dimensional vector. The two outputs of these subnetworks are concatenated and then fed to the comparator network, which has four layers, more size 300 units, 115 units, 15 units, and 10 units with full connectivity between the four layers. Then, Output is back to the classification unit, which consists of a logistic unit. In our experiments, we achieve the best performance with a dropout rate of 20%. The dropout technique is a method to avoid the outfitting. Next, I will introduce the experimental results to evaluate the ability to judge true or false clone pairs of our model. We applied our model method to detect clones with target clone pairs in Bitcoin Bench. And we set the threshold as 0 0.5. It is supported as true clone pairs if it varies above 0 0.5, like other uh, works do. We compare 
with some theta of the R method, such as the same the LH and the weighted RA, we make a fair comparison. We compare with their reported numbers and we calculate the FE score for the weighted RAE by using the recall and the precision values at the threshold 0.4 reported in the paper. However, it is still hard to compare with deep same which one is better. So that we need to compare the FE score. Our cell RAE has a very tiny better score than the deep same. Therefore, we can regard cell RAE2 as well as deep same. What needs to be to be emphasized is better precision. It's more important when judge whether it is a true clone pair, which means that the cell RAE returns less false clone pairs when detecting cold clone pairs. And also we did a whole process from extracting the function to choosing function pairs as potential clone pairs to detect. It is emphasized that this is the normal way which is approved in Bitcoin EO. We detected all combinations of 7,500,438 7, functions in B3 reduced. It's obviously that IRA has extraordinary high recall in MT3, W3, K3 types clones, but slightly theory in detecting clones of type 1, type 2, and very strong type 3. They can detect semantic clone pairs very well. And our cell RVE reached the recall at 95.716 in MT3 times and very high recall at 93% for weekly type 3. Firstly, so why Sarah, you can achieve so high recalls? First, related and also you can have recalls in the MT3 types. So it is believable that RE can has excellent ability to represent thematic information in function, which is important to detect MT3 and the WT3 type. Types clones. Secondly, weekly type three and type four takes the most percentage of the data set. The percentage of the moderated type three is one percent, but weekly type three and type four uh, occupies the ninety eight percent in the data set. Shown in the table, therefore. When we try and compare it to network for similarity measurements, the most true comparison in the training set is the P3 and Type 4. It is a great advantage compared to network learning to pick out the okay, Type 3 and Type 4 clone compares. Then compare the tradition RE and weighted RE from many aspects. It was proved that weighted RE performs better than the traditional RE from experimental results. The weighted RE only calculates distance between the vectors encoding functions to the weighted RE consider no weight information in abstract analogy to increase the proportion of information contributed by bottom nodes in abstract analytic tree when training the RE. Deploy one submit architecture by using comparator network and one classification unit to measure the similarity of code pairs. Next, uh, I will introduce the last part conclusion. We did, in this paper, 
we mainly do two contributions. First, we design our Siamese network. Yeah. And also, we also in a learning model for one detection. Semantical. And we have high recording during tiny scenarios. And then we conduct a comprehension experiments on both targets to be convinced to be Other <coughs> experimental results suggest that our approach is up for most of the SOTA works. That's all. That's all. I thank you for advice. Jesus. Um, okay, so thanks. Uh, I think uh, I'm not sure. Crisis awareness problems raises uh, interest. Damage. Okay, so I'm not sure if uh, I think the authors doesn't appear. So I think uh, it's not necessary to ask question about this paper. Uh, since we still have several minutes, so I'm not sure if you have any questions about the three presented paper in this session. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. No? Okay. That's great. Okay, thanks a lot for all of your participation and thanks all the speakers about the next presentation. So it's a pity to not see you physically in Singapore, but still hopefully we can, hopefully next year everything will come back to normal. So thanks a lot, thanks again for your work and uh, all the best guys, see you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Next time. Thank you. See you.